Yes, church is everywhere. A.W. Tozer once said, If you burn down the church building and drive away all the people, you have not disturbed Christian worship at all. Keep a Christian from entering the church sanctuary and you have not in the least bit hindered his worship. We carry our sanctuary with us. We never leave it. Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Alliance Online Church. My name is Joel and I am the lead pastor here. Our family ministries pastor is away on parental leave and Pastor Sam, our lay pastor, uh, has been with us for more than 12 years, is also on our staff. Welcome to Online Church this morning. Today is a special day because this is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit onto Christ's church. As described in Acts chapter 2, this was the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all God's people and the church was born. On that day, the scriptures say there were about 120 believers gathered together in one place. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, it says they began speaking in other tongues, in other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. And then the scriptures continue with these words. Buenos días de México, familia de Cornerstone. Bienvenidos a Cornerstone en línea. Sabah al khair. Alan usalam bikum fil kinisa. Masurin giddan tukunu ma'ana fil kinisa hada sabah. Annyeonghaseyo. Chul achimimida. Onel chaye kwee oishin gosil. Hanyeonghamida. Buenos días, Cornerstone. Buen, bienvenido a la iglesia en línea. Hi everyone, welcome to church. Bonjour. Et bienvenue à l'église aujourd'hui. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. As we continue on with our service, just let me remind you uh, that there is a chat going on throughout the service on the side. Please feel free uh, to make comments or ask questions and let us know you're here. Um, we can't see you. We can't see each other. You can only see me. And so uh, who's here? Uh, where are you watching from? Please feel free to, to chat uh, on the side there. We also have hosts that are ready and willing and available to pray with you. So there's a live prayer button. Please click on that and we a separate a pop-up window, a private window will open up and we would love to pray with you at any time during the service. You'll also notice there are different tabs at the bottom and at the top. There's a notes tab that has sermon notes. There's a Bible tab if you want to read the Bible in that section. And then there's also a COVID-19 help section at the top. And you can find different ways where you can be helping others during this time. And if you ever need anything, click on there and there's lots of resources to help you. Let us know how we can be serving you at this time as well. Let me open uh, with a word of prayer. Please close your eyes and bow your heads. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as all that you have made for us is made a, real a reality to us by your Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you for sending this advocate. We thank you for uh, giving us this wonderful gift. And so on this day of Pentecost, we pause to pray and give you our special uh, heart of thankfulness that Christ did not leave us alone, that he sent the spirit of truth, the spirit of power and enablement. And so today we pray that we may surrender to the Holy Spirit as fully as we can in order that Christ might be glorified in and through each one of us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 
Let me read from Psalm uh, chapter 104. These are uh, verses 24 uh, to 34. Psalm 104, starting at verse 24. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan which you formed to frolic there. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. During this time, and maybe especially during this time, this has been a crazy year so far, and it only promises to get crazier as the days go by. You remember before pandemic was big news, the wildfires in Australia was probably one of the biggest stories of the decade. And now we've all but forgotten that in light of the pandemic. And then crazy things are happening. And there are crimes that are motivated uh, because of um, drug use or addictions right here on the streets of Winnipeg. There are crimes around the world that are being perpetrated in the name of racism or things that seem to be racially motivated. And so now more than ever, we long for Christ's spirit to come to renew us and to bring uh, unity and to restore all things to how they need to be. Watch this prayer on video. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen? Feel free to say uh, amen out loud right uh, where you are seated. As I mentioned earlier, the, the story of Pentecost is also the story of the church. 
before that day of Pentecost, there was no church. And when the Holy Spirit came down and that first day of Pentecost happened, then the church was born. And a, a, a small group of 150 people grew to 3,000 and then grew to be in all over uh, the globe. And so we pray, Lord, build your kingdom here. Build your church. We know that your plans will never falter. Whatever comes our way does not matter because your plans are true. And so, Lord, let us pray and let us all sing together uh, this song, Build Your Kingdom Here. Please uh, feel free to follow along in the lyrics and sing out loud right where you are. I know that you know this song. We are the church. 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of spirits, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, 
and in everyone it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentiles, slave or free, we are all given to one Spirit to drink. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, and when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, amazed and perplexed, what can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood, and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, that is the story of Pentecost, or at least part of it. The story continues if you have your Bibles and you want to look at Acts chapter 2. Peter is addressing this crowd and he's, he's preaching to them basically. And after he says what you just saw uh, in, in the movie, he explains to them that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And he quotes from, uh, from the Old Testament. He quotes a Psalm that David had written. And then he says, but this is not referring to David because David is dead. This is referring to the Messiah, this one whom you crucified. And when the people were, were convinced of that, the, um, they were, it says that they were cut to the heart. He said, uh, therefore, let all of you be sure of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah in verse 36. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Um, there, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They asked that question. So Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 
And those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's what the scriptures say. This is an incredible story. As I mentioned earlier, the birth of the church. When Jesus uh, spent time with his disciples, with, his, with the followers after he came back to life, after he was resurrected. And then last week, uh, there was, um, we celebrated the ascension and then Jesus ascended. But before he ascended, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift that has been promised. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we talked about this a little bit last week. He says, um, you will receive power. Okay, you will receive power. We all want power, right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now on this day of Pentecost, this is what is happening. They have become witnesses. What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to come with power on his people? One of the things it means is that they become witnesses. Now, how do you feel when you hear that word? Witnesses. And you will be Jesus' witnesses. You will be God's witnesses. You think of, of sharing your faith, uh, evangelism. And, and undoubtedly, many of you maybe don't like that word. Maybe we... We feel a little guilty sometimes because we know that this is something that we should be doing as believers. We need to be evangelizing. We, and we have such a great um, thing. We have the Holy Spirit and we have so many uh, reasons to have hope in a world that is filled with despair. And so, of course, we want to share this with other people. And so we, we know that, right? But then we don't maybe do as we feel we, we should be doing. And so the topic of evangelism can bring up guilt feelings for people as well. You know, maybe we've, um, in our life group, we have prayed for um, someone who, maybe someone in your family or a friend or someone at work who's not a believer, and then maybe even prayed, asked people to pray for an opportunity to share your faith. And then after you prayed that week, an opportunity came up. And you knew that was the opportunity, but you didn't do anything. And have you ever had that experience? Then you feel, you know, guilty. Oh, I shoulda, you know, I coulda, you know, what if? And so it can be a heavy topic for people. But this is um, part of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is, this, the church does not exist for itself. The church is on mission. God has a mission and the church is part of that. And so the Holy Spirit will come on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so how do we do that? Especially uh, today. In our culture, in our society, there's, it's, you might find it difficult or very, um, it may, you may not feel it's the right atmosphere. This is a society where we have a lot of different beliefs and a lot of different religions. And so generally we think you, it's okay for people to, we're very accepting and we're very tolerant. And so you can be Buddhist, hey, that is fine. Uh, or Muslim, or you can not have a religion, or you, whatever you feel is good for you, that's fine. But, and I'm happy for you, but don't push your beliefs on me, right? And so we have, we have, maybe we feel a little bit of reticence to be able to, share. we have something good, so how do we, how do we do this? Of course, yes, the Spirit has empowered us to do this, and when we pray, He will give us the power to do so. But, I mean, in the past, there, like, we're, there maybe have been uh, evangelistic uh, events or, or, or things done by the church that maybe weren't done so well and have left people with hard feelings. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to run, you know, crusades anymore, but perhaps some of the ways we, we have tried to share our faith have not been so helpful. And so here's Peter on the day of Pentecost. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and 3,000 people are added to his number that day. I wonder if he has uh, to their number that day. I wonder if he has maybe something that he could Tell us today in, in this kind of uh, pluralistic and post-Christian society. You know, there was, um, well, as I was preparing this message, I thought of uh, a video clip that I remember seeing um, from an old movie. Well, maybe not that old, but uh, it's not recent. And uh, there's, it's a, a clip in a, a supermarket, some sort of grocery store. Uh, Jennifer Aniston is in the movie and she's named Justine. And then there's this other coworker who's, uh, his name is Corny. And so uh, just as Justine was planning to leave, she finished her shift, she's on her way out the door. Corny says, hey, Justine, 
can I talk to you for a second? She says, yeah. He says, I was just curious. You know, have you ever been to a Bible study? You know, she's a little bit cautious. She's like, yeah. And he says, yeah, well, we got a good one going on, you know, every Wednesday at the First Church of the Nazarene. You know, Rodney comes, Benita comes. You got any interest in reading the Bible? You know, and Justine's like, well, I, you know, I, I, mean, I have my own beliefs. And then he says, well, we don't preach fire and brimstone. You know, Ten Commandments, got to live by those. Other than the usual ways, we're not interested in scaring people. We're just about loving Jesus. And, you know, and Justine says, uh -huh, yeah, well, I kind of I kind of like my nights to myself. And then he replies, well, maybe you'll have night after night of eternal hellfire all to yourself. Just kidding. Drive safe. And so if I could show you that video clip, I would show it to you and say, this is a good example of how not to be witnesses, of how not to share your faith. But are there ways that we can do this? And I, I believe this is, we have something good. You know, we have something wonderful. And so let us share. Let God fill us with the power to do this and let us be the church. But how do we do that today? It's, it's not easy. You know, we, you have your truth and, and I have my truth and it used to be just the truth, but now there's, I'd like to share my truth with someone else and could you tell me your truth? And so we don't want to be interfering. We don't want to be pushy. And so how is it then that we can do this? You know, here's a famous verse, and I mentioned first, uh, Peter probably has something to say to us, right? He, he was a pretty good evangelist, you must admit. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, you see these words. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. Okay, this is, I'm sure you've heard this before. If you've been in any evangelistic course or if you've been in an apologetics course, this is probably their key verse. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But look at this carefully. There's, something's assumed here, isn't there? What's, what's assumed here? Can you just take a minute and look at this? There's, the assumption is there was a question that was asked. See, always be prepared to give an answer, okay, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You see, it's, it's one thing to, 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 to say things to someone who wasn't really looking for it, or maybe they're just pretending to listen, or, you know, just, you know, nodding politely. But it's another one to, to be responding to someone's question when they're looking, or when they're asking for a question. I believe as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are probably living questionable lives. In other words, people see how we live and they think, why? Or why would you do that? Or how are you doing that? And this is exactly what happened with, with Jesus as he was, people were like, wow, this is amazing. I want to learn more. And so they would follow him. And so if you, you see, there's, there's an assumption here and it's, if people can just ask us, if people ask you a question, you have every right to talk with them. But if you just come up to them off the street, then people are going to, might be offended or they, they might be polite, but they're not really looking for this. How do, we, how do we get people to ask questions by living a questionable life? You see, even if you look at um, that first amazing sermon in Acts chapter 2, let's just look at that for a second because this is also Peter, the same Peter who wrote, who wrote this. Remember, there was the Holy Spirit had come, come down and then people were speaking in all these different languages because people had come from all over, all over that area of the world um, for this special feast. And then um, they, were, um, they were perplexed and amazed in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 12. They, they're like, what is going on? Okay, we... We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? And then that's the impetus for Peter's sermon. He says, you know, some, they thought, oh, you know, they're just making fun of them. They've had too much wine. They're acting crazy. So then Peter stood up and addressed them and answered their question. And we saw the story of Pentecost and I explained to us so that he goes through all this. And do you remember, he gets to the end of his message, he's explaining to them that this Jesus you crucified, he's the Messiah, and then they're, they're cut to the heart, and they ask a question. Do you remember? Brothers, what shall we do? And so this, there was this amazing uh, phenomena that happened, 
And they're, ah, they see this and they're asking, what? So, so Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So he's, he's ask, answering a question that these people are. Again, Acts chapter 3, actually Peter is really good at this. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, just flip over to Acts chapter 3. And this is, a, this is a fantastic story. It's Peter and John are now together. And they're going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon, it says. There was a man who was lame from birth. And he was being, being carried uh, into the, to the temple gate. And every day he was put there uh, to beg from those going into the temple courts. And so this man who had been born from birth was carried there, laid down, left there. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Hey, I need money. But Peter looked straight at him, and so did John. And then Peter said, look at us. I mean, you know, so the men gave him his attention, expected to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do ha have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And so the men, he took him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the men's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and, and praising God. And then it says, when all the people saw this, they saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the same man who always used to sit there and beg as, as, as we walked in. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And then verse 11 says, um, all the people were astonished and came running to Peter and John in the place called Solomon's Colony. You see, there was this desire, people wanting to know more and asking. Um, Paul would, would be very, you know, it's not just Peter, but Colossians chapter 4. Let me just uh, read this to you. He would, he's, he, I, think, I think they agree with each other here. Colossians chapter 4, he says, um, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. He's asking for an open door, okay, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, for which I am in chains. He says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that everyone may know how to, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Again, you see there's this assumption that people are going to ask. They're going to see something. They're going to experience something. And they're going to want to know more. Please tell me more. So how is it then? How do we live in such a way so people want to ask questions so that they want to know more? And when they've asked, then we're able to just tell them our story and able to be a witness as the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do. How do we do that? Well, I've intentionally left out first, the first part of this verse because most people leave it, do you, right? You, if you've heard this verse, you've probably heard it this way. You probably think this is the beginning, but look, there's a gap here. And so, again, always, I've said so many times, context, context, context. Don't just read one verse, read the verses before and after. Pretend there's no verses and chapter divisions, and let's see what it says. So here, at the beginning, it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Make Christ your Lord in your hearts of your entire life. Live in such a way that he's in charge. He's the boss. And he is. He's ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of his Father in heaven. And he is always relaxed. He's, he, nothing surprises him. He is our Lord. So if we were to live, if we were to revere him as Lord, people are going to ask questions. How? Like, what? Why? I saw you. Explain to me, how are you able to do this? Why are you able to do this? If you have, let's flip over to 1 Peter. There's, um, this whole book is filled with wonderful examples like this. In 1 Peter um, chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. If you were to live... If you, first of all, before you get to this part, in your hearts, revere Christ as your Lord. Not just verbally, but in your whole life. In your hearts, revere him as Lord. And as you live that way, it'll be surprising. It will be amazing. It might confuse people. You know what? Why are you serving people all the time? Well, Jesus Christ came to serve. 
He didn't come to lord it over people. He came to be a servant. You know, what, why are you so loving? Well, Jesus loves me. God loves me. What, how can you forgive so easily? Well, if you knew how much God has forgiven me and the forgiveness that Christ has, has given me, then it's easy to forgive. We forgive because Christ forgave us. We, we are servants because Christ is a servant. All of our actions are, they're not just random you know, things here and there. They are based on the character of God. And so God expects us also to care for foreigners and widows because we were once that same way. God asks us to love one another because he loves us. God says, be holy, therefore, as I am holy. And so if you revere Christ as Lord, people are going to be like, wait a minute, I want to know more. I want to ask questions. So we need to be living a questionable life, or as one person said, a provocative lifestyle that would provoke questions. First and foremost, make Christ your Lord. And so in 1 Peter, this great example is here. He's talking about submitting yourselves for the Lord's sake, okay, for the Lord's sake to the human authorities. And um, um, in, in the marriage relationship, there's submission and then there's respect. And people are like, why, how are you doing this? And this is because I want to be a witness um, to the Lord. So you can read all that in chapter 2, chapter 3, Jesus' life, verse seven, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to, to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Therefore, it's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. All of these behaviors that are described in first bit humility, you know, servanthood, love, they're all based in the person and character of Jesus Christ. And so before we get to the second part of this verse, if we can revere in our hearts, act as if Christ is the Lord because he is the Lord, people will wonder, why are you doing that? They'll ask questions. So before we get on a pedestal or on a street corner and start screaming at people in angry voices, let's live. Let's, li let's love one another. And people around you, as they get to know you, they're going to think, you're different. I want to know why. I want what you have. You know, being, a, a, we're not salespeople, but I know a friend who's, I think it's called Beachbody, and he's a salesperson, or I'm not really, probably does on the side. But I knew him a long time ago, and I don't even know if he's listening or watching this right now. It's funny, because when we're in the building, I know he's not, because I can see, but um, anyway, he's, it's wonderful, because I knew him before, and he wasn't all that, you know, muscular or strong. But I see him now, and I see him working out, and I think, well, he's, I could see his abs. He's got abs and he's got biceps. And, and so he's promoting uh, the, this, I think it's beach body or whatever things, but I can see he's, it, it's like he's living his product. And so if, if someone was, you know, eating potato chips on the couch and they're grossly overweight and they're trying to sell you a beach body, you know, it doesn't work that way. Or, or if they hire actors, you know, to do it, but I can see this has made a difference. He's transformed. And so even though I haven't bought into it yet, just because I didn't want to spend the money, but I, if I were, I would use that product because I can see the transformed results. So same way, revere Christ as Lord, and people are going to ask questions. There is this um, great story. You may have heard of it from church history. Way back in the fourth century, um, a man named Pacomius, who was uh, Egyptian, and he was recruited into, conscripted into the Roman army back uh, in the fourth century. And then he was taken uh, into prison. And um, he said he, he was visited by these, a strange group of people. And they brought gifts of food and drink. And so he was intrigued, like, why would they come to visit someone they didn't know? And they actually have no obligation to this person. So he asked, and he received the answer that it was because they were followers of this Jesus of Nazareth. And they had a custom of visiting those in prison as they would visit Jesus himself, just as their Lord had taught them. See, they were revering Christ as Lord in their hearts and their actions showed them that. And then Pacomius is like, well, why are you doing this? And so he asks the question and they told him why. And Pacomius was so impressed, he decided to become one of these so-called Christians. 
and in time he became to be one of the most important founders of, of uh, one of these communal Christian um, um, movements back in those days. So this is the powerful example in history of how uh, living this transformed life. And so maybe you don't need to feel so guilty if you're not always proclaiming the good news to everyone around you. Now, some of you have the gift of evangelism. Many of you probably don't. As Mark read earlier from uh, 1 Corinthians, another example, another sign of the Holy Spirit manifesting is, is in all the wide variety of gifts and abilities that he gives to the church. And we all need each other. And there's nothing that would, that would uh, make us assume that every single believer has the gift of evangelism or every single believer has the gift of teaching. Every single believer has a gift, has something that God has given them to help build up the church, but you may not have been given the gift of evangelism. I know for a fact some of you do, but we don't all have that. And so it's okay if you don't have that gift. We're not all called to evangelize. We're not all called to preach. We're not all called to lead worship. We're not all called to create beautiful paintings that glorify Christ. But we are called to live a questionable lifestyle. We are all called to live um, a lifestyle that provokes questions, especially in our society today. We're all called to live and to revere Christ as our Lord. And when we do that, the questions will come. And then it's so much easier to share, well, here's how or here's why. And maybe I don't have all your questions, but I can just tell you my story and this is why I'm living uh, this way. So living in a way that provokes questions. This is part of what it means, the part of what the story of Pentecost means, because he said the Holy Spirit will come on the church and you'll be empowered to be witnesses. And so if we're not empowered to be witnesses, then, then who are we as a church? The church exists for other people. So, how do we tangibly, practically live this way? Um, I'm sure you've already thought of many ideas. I'm just going to leave you with, with this. Bless others. I'm going to give you three ways of blessing um, other people. Here is one way that we can live a, a lifestyle that provokes questions. You see, bless means... Um, choo! Sorry, did you say bless me? Thank you. You're, you're wishing uh, good health on me. So you're, you're blessing me that way. So um, when we bless someone, we are hoping, we're asking for what's best for them um, to confer prosperity or, or good health um, upon them. And uh, one person said that this term to bless, when you want to bless someone, it's like um, you could understand it as adding strength to their arms. Like to bless someone, you could understand, could be, so to bless someone means to add strength to her arms or to add strength to his arm. So then this would mean to bless someone would be to build them up, to fill them with encouragement and to increase, for them to increase in strength and prosperity. So. What would it mean to, to build? So this is just an example of one way that we can live a questionable lifestyle. What would it mean to, to be able to add strength to another person's arms? You know, anything that helps them you know, breathe a little easily, a little more easily. Anything that, that lifts their spirits or alleviates their stress. It can be small things or it can be large things. So here's three ways. Okay, and I already showed you the first way. Words of affirmation. Mark Twain, popular author, once said, I can live for two months on one good compliment. Can you relate to that? You know, I remember three weeks ago when this person, you know, just showed how much they appreciated what I was doing at work. And I was living on that, you know, for weeks to come. So ways of blessing, what one way to be, give words of affirmation. And many of you are, you, of you are familiar with the, the five love languages. I believe this is one of those love languages, encouraging words, words of, of affirmation. A word of affirmation, a word of encouragement will help another person breathe 
little more easily. So let, let's learn to bless other people. This is just one example. You can think of others, but let's bless others. It would be one way of living a questionable life. Another way of blessing someone would be um, an act of kindness. Not because we want something in return, but just, I'm just going to do this. You know, I was cutting my lawn and I just, I'm just going to cut your lawn or shovel your driveway. I'm just going to do this way. See, wouldn't that add strength uh, to someone's arms? It can, it can be a big thing or it can be a small thing. You know, get, grabbing a bunch of uh, people together and, and, and uh, helping put on a new roof for a neighbor who's elderly, for example. This would be just an act of kindness. These are kinds of things that that's a way of blessing someone else. And when we live these things, like Pacomius was like, what? Why are you doing this? Oh, because we, we are visiting people in prison as if they are Jesus, just like our Lord and Savior did and asked us to do. So, or another way, um, this is probably a love language for many of us, for many of you, is gifts. Just give something, something small. Uh, maybe buy someone a coffee. Uh, remember birthdays, remember anniversaries, and maybe even just an, uh, a gift could be a text. Hey, I remember it's your anniversary today. Happy anniversary. Some sort of way to acknowledge. It doesn't have to be, um, I'm not talking about just people in church, but people at work or home, at school. The act of blessing. Some, here's just some ways. I mean, you know how to bless people, but just some examples that can have a huge impact. And it could have a huge evangelistic impact as well. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's a, a book written not too long ago, and uh, the doctoral thesis, it was written on a doctoral thesis that was entitled, Blessers versus Converters. So the, there was um, two short-term mission teams from different churches, and, and they went to Thailand. And one of the teams went simply to bless and to help them out uh, in any way that they can. Um, to create a better environment in that town or whatever. They, they we're just going to go and bless them. And the other short-term mission team went to convert. And so they took every advantage to, to give evangelistic outreaches and, and, and preach the gospel as much as possible. So what did the results show? The results showed, of course, well, the blessers had a, a much larger social impact. But of course, that was their main goal was to do that. They had a, a bigger blessing on, on the society, on the neighborhood, and the, and the towns than than the converters did. But what's more surprising is that the blessers actually were 50% uh, more effective, if that's the right term, in, um, in evangelism. There are 50% more people decided to become Christians uh, because of the blessers than because of the converters. And so you see, just, just being a blessing to other people is a wonderful way to be evangelistic. To, to, be, to be sharing your faith and to being a witness. And so God has blessed us with so much and he wants us to be a blessing to others as well. So we, pass, we receive it and we pass it along. Everything we do comes from the character of God. So I think this may be a little more accessible for many of us. Some of you have the gift of evangelism and you know it and so you need to be empowered and, and encouraged to go all out and keep doing what you're doing. For those of us who don't think we have the gift of evangelism, you do have a calling to live a questionable lifestyle and why don't you just bless people? Why don't you, for example, you could say this week I'm going to bless three people. Do you think you could do that? You know, some small ways. They don't have to be really big. I'll bless, you know, one person from my church in my church community. Maybe I'll, I'll send them a word of affirmation or I'll give a little gift or I'll just do a random act of kindness. And then why don't you decide to bless also someone who's not part of your church, maybe someone who's not a believer in some way. And then, you know, and just add another one. It could be from inside or, or, or outside your church community. But when people are blessing each other inside the church, it, it, it just look, can you imagine how that would affect the community. You know, Jesus said, everyone's going to know that uh, you are my disciples by how you love each other. And by, by your love will, will people know. And so this will build up our morale. People, it'll be, end up, oh, well, I, it's much easier to bless other people 
because we're, we're, it's going around a lot, and then that will overflow, you know, or, and then people will see that, and they might begin to ask questions. Why, why are you doing these things? You know, why are you being so nice? How can you forgive me? And when they ask questions, then we can be a witness to what Christ has, has accomplished in our lives. Now, just to give um, a couple things to, to clarify, though, when we're blessing, uh, we're just blessing to be a blessing. We don't have ulterior motives. Well, I'm not going to do something for my neighbor in the hopes that they will come to church with me, or I'm not going to do, um, do something in order to convert them. Just, just bless. Uh, let the Holy Spirit work. Let, let God do what God does. He's in control of those things. So don't, don't do it for any other alternative. And people see through that. I mean, you, you see through that when other people, you know, wait a minute, why are you expecting something in return? So they may judge you for that, but as long as you're free of that, you, you know, people will misunderstand us sometimes, right? But just make sure that in your heart, you, you're simply wanting to be a blessing. That's it. And also the recipient um, needs to feel blessed. If you're familiar with the love languages, then, then you probably know what I'm saying, but different people will receive things differently. And so it, you might think, oh, I'm being really helpful. But this person's like, no, you're not actually like, I actually really like gardening on my own. It, it's a, it's a, my alone time. It's my time where I get re-energized. So if we're coming and doing all that for them, it may not feel like a blessing to them. So don't do it for any other reason, but also make sure that they feel that they're being blessed. And so getting to know um, the different people in your life and, and what they want and what they like and what they appreciate would help you to be a blessing. In Philippians chapter two, Verses three to four, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Okay, so just bless to bless, that's it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What's good for them? Let me help them, let me bless them in that way. And then also on the flip side, Proverbs 27, 14, it says, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. And I had a roommate that used to bless me loudly in the morning. He'd wake up an hour before I ever want to wake up and good morning and turn all the lights on. He felt he was being a blessing to me, but he, I was not receiving that as a blessing, just like Proverbs 27, 14 says. So this is the birth of the church. The church does not exist for itself. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. And this is, this is um, kind of a... Um, proof that we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we are witnesses. And so today, what? let's live lives that are questionable. Let's live lives that provoke questions by honoring Christ as Lord, revering Him as Lord. And you know what? As people get to know you, they're going to wonder and they're going to ask questions. They might say, hey, can you go for coffee one time? Or they might text you and they're going to want to know the reason for the hope that you have. So be ready for that. Um, Here's a, a story, again, just to reiterate though, people need to recognize that this is a blessing. We're not doing it out of uh, our own selfish you know, ambition, but the founding father of uh, the country of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, um, he's noted as saying this, and I think the Dalai Lama has also been attributed, this has been attributed to him as well, but he says, when the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land, and the missionaries had the Bible. Have you heard this before? It says, they taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. And so, yes, it is true that sometimes even the church and even well-intentioned Christians have done things out of selfish ambition or things have been misinterpreted. But regardless, we have good news. And so learn about your neighbors. Learn what, what makes them happy and find ways that you can be a blessing to them. Can you do three blessings? Can you bless another person just three times this week and every week? Choose someone in our church community or in your church community. Send them a word of affirmation or, or do an act of kindness or, or give them a gift. And find someone outside of that, maybe someone who, who is not a believer yet, just, you know, I'm gonna do this. And then a third person can be your choice, anyone you want. Can you imagine what life might be like if every single person in our entire city chose to bless three different people every week? 
I think the world would be a different place. I think our church would be a different place. And I think people will want more of that. The Holy Spirit will empower you to be his witness. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for your wisdom. I thank you for you know, this plan that you put into place so long ago. Jesus coming and, and being killed and then coming back to life and ascending and then sending a spirit. And Lord, as, as, as Jesus was sent and then as your Holy Spirit is sent and, and now we are sent as your church into this world, Give us your power. Give us the boldness, just as, as the apostles asked for prayer for. Help us understand where our gifts are. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will uh, take our offering. And um, I also just want to remind you that as things are starting to open up, you will, um, you will receive some, some news and updates from our church. We are not planning on opening uh, our building for Sunday morning services yet, not in phase two at least. But since we're entering phase two tomorrow, uh, just a public service announcement, that means the uh, school zones are back on. They were postponed, they were uh, rescheduled, and we did not have to slow down to 30 kilometers an hour in front of schools for the last couple of months. But starting tomorrow, we do. Oh, some of you did not know that. Uh, you thought the school zones were maybe, yeah, I know you're the people in front of us slowing down. And so thank you, though, because that's a great opportunity for us to slow down and to practice patience, right? We're, we're not in that much of a hurry. We shouldn't be. But anyway, starting tomorrow, school zones are back on. So please slow down in front of the schools. Uh, we don't want you getting one of those expensive speeding tickets because we would love you to spend that money elsewhere like in a global advance fund. That money that, that we use, we don't keep any of it, we send it on to support international workers around the world. And last week I announced that we are a little bit uh, short of our goal of 10% of all our givings, minimum 10% we want to give to global advance fund. It was 2.2% it was last week. Well, as of Wednesday, this week it's up to 7.7%. So thank you for listening. Thank you for continuing with that. And uh, in just a minute, there'll be some instructions on the screen to show you how to give. And if you want to designate that, for Global Advance Fund, please do, maybe from now on, if you can remember, 10% uh, of your givings, you, we, we recommend you send to that. Just send an email after you've given to sam at cornerstonealliance.ca and let him know, uh, I'd like this to be divided up here, here, or here. So thank you for that. Please take this opportunity um, to give, and then I'll be right back after that. Thank you as always for your generosity and thank you for those of you who have uh, answered the trivia question in the three things thursday newsletter uh, each week we are giving away um, a gift certificate this week it's for something local right in windsor park part of our community and so those of you who have responded to the newsletter question i have your names and right after this service uh, when we in our virtual lobby I will spin the wheel on my phone and will announce who the winner is of that gift certificate. So if you'd like to join us uh, for the virtual lobby, the, the link is in the notes. We'll just hang out for a little bit, see each other's faces, get caught up and ask about uh, you know, how things have been going on uh, lately. So anyone, even if you're new, uh, please join us. The link is there. Now let me send you off at the end of this service. You have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. So go forth from here to wherever you are going next with boldness to be witnesses, joyful witnesses of Christ in this world and all that Christ has done for you. Amen.